just a brief comment. We're starting just a little bit late, but uh, I think I'll try and slip this in anyway. Remember last week we talked to you about uh, David Coppedge and the trial that's going on in Los Angeles. Uh, he has sued uh, Jet Proportional Laboratory and uh, for uh, demoting him. I think that's the key issue and so on. And uh, so what's going on right now is that uh, in general, uh, both sides, you see this is JPL Jet versus David Coppedge, uh, a creationist. And uh, he feels that he was prejudicially demoted. Uh, and both sides are trying to prove how bad the other side is. And uh, one judge is going to decide all this. Uh, one thing that uh, I could relate to very closely in that in connection with the Arkansas trial way back in the early 80s uh, that I was involved in, the judge uh, told David that he should answer only the, qu the questions only with a yes or no. Those of you who have been in court trials know a little bit about that game. And uh, uh, David uh, was you know, trying to add a few comments and enlighten the, the question a little bit. But he, he made this comment later on. He says, uh, somebody asked him a question. He said, this is not a yes or no question. This is out of context. I'm learning the art of spin doctoring here. These, these lawyers ask you certain questions, you know, like, uh, when are you going to quit uh, beating your wife? Yes or no? Uh, and you get caught that. And uh, Arkansas trial, uh, it was that same situation. And then they take you out of context, and all is normal, of course. This happens to everything all over the world, on the internet right now, and so on. But that's, uh, uh, it's part of the system, and I, I really strongly object to it. Uh, but that's, that's where we are on the thing. Now, uh, as far as uh, references, I just thought I'd mention these. Uh, uh, this is Paul's book, Scientific Theology, which you can get on the internet. And then, uh, you had a question? Why did they keep what? Why did they keep him employed? Oh, so long if he was so bad. Uh, yeah, well, it, why was he in charge of the uh, uh, Cassini program if he was so bad? Uh, it's I don't know how all of this is, but anyway, it's uh, these things never have a very happy ending as usual. Uh, anyway, Paul's book, Scientific Theology, chapter five. Uh, I think uh, deserves special mention uh, in terms of giving you uh, about, it's about 80 pages. Uh, it's called Josh, uh, but the Pentateuch and Joshua, but it's really a discussion of radiometric dating. Uh, the best I know of in uh, uh, book form uh, in the Adventist uh, world at present regarding radiometric dating. Uh, this book, I'll tell you a little bit about the battle. Uh, it's called the, 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 the Triumph of Evolution. And then they wrote, and backwards, and the failure of creationism, Niles Eldridge. Uh, and he, he brings up a number of these icons. Uh, interestingly, I haven't read the whole book. He does not mention the question of the origin of life in this book, which is, you know, <laughs> perhaps the most significant icon we find in terms of uh, substantiating uh, problems for evolution. Uh, at least it's not in the index, uh, I, I can say, and so on. Uh, Niles Eldridge, he worked with Steve Gould in uh, producing the punctuated equilibrium thing. And uh, yes, there's some good things in this book, uh, some good points, and you, you get to understand. And some of them aren't so good. Part of the battle here, once he's describing here something we'll talk about, uh, just a little bit later, and that is the, the question of the flood and the geologic column and so on. 
And so in, in concluding that section, uh, dealing with ecological zonation, uh, he says, no, it is the creationists, not the geologists, who distort the truth. Freely slinging mud at all who cross their peculiarity myopic view, I'm sorry, peculiarly myopic view, myopic view of the natural world. It tells you a little bit about their attitude. And uh, you wonder who's mud slinging. Uh, my book, Science Discovers God, addresses the question of God. Uh, my book, Origins, Linking Science and Scripture, uh, tries to put the Bible and science together. Uh, this one's more from a historical perspective, uh, very interesting. Uh, Michael Roos, uh, The Evolution Wars, uh, and he uh, gives some interesting issues, uh, quotes Platinga in there about the origin of life issue and so on, and how uh, uh, Platinga feels that, you know, Platinga is a uh, philosopher, I guess, you know, a theologian, uh, probably the leading theologian. Uh, at least he considered him the leading theologian, uh, American theologian. Now he's at Notre Dame University in uh, South Bend, Indiana. Uh, very, very uh, respected philosopher. But he, he, uh, he just said this, trying to or have the origin of life, uh, it's totally impossible, uh, it's his feeling. So, uh, the book gives you the two sides that we're talking about here, and, and this question of these uh, persistent uh, icons. Uh, and uh, I'm using this kind of as a, an excuse uh, to tell you about uh, <coughs> a, a, uh, uh, the Bible and Science series that I just finished. Uh, you folks have time to raise the question, when are you going to get this done, when are you going to get this done? Uh, and uh, I've just uh, released it three weeks ago. Uh, and it's designed for, uh, actually the, the person I was looking for was the high school student in the Adventist school. Uh, that, that's kind of the, the middle target. And uh, we have very little material at that level very little material at that level. And uh, I've been working on these things and take, took, took various factors from PowerPoint presentations and so on, made a, a apparent support sequence here that has uh, 1,268 slides. Uh, <coughs> thanks to Anita Oliver here, who went through the series incidentally, and uh, uh, it was only 800 slides before she looked at it. Uh, <laughs> and she, she about split, split about a third of my slides into two. They were too long. You know, there's an attention, attention def deficit order here. I've uh, <coughs> been doing some tutoring with uh, some students, uh, and I can tell you, even at the elementary level, uh, some of these students are pretty sharp. They're pretty sharp, and they, they know what's going on. And, uh, but still, uh, more or less uh, one ID on one slide is a much better thing than uh, the way it was before. And uh, I thank her for her, uh, her help here. There are 17 discussions, uh, and uh, there are several sections in each discussion, uh, and each one is uh, broken down with a title slide and so on. To, uh, so a student won't get too discouraged uh, when, when a discussion goes on too long for too many slides, you know, like 100 slides. This is too much for them. Uh, <coughs> and uh, here generally K through 12 uh, for advanced students, and I would say uh, <coughs> some students, if they, if they knew everything was in here, of course, they would certainly be able to pass a college uh, course. In, uh, creation and evolution of philosophical biology, whatever title you want to give to it, and so on. So th that's uh, uh, what we're talking about here. 
I mean, I want to pick on some of these highlights as we, as we talk uh, about it, as we go through it. Uh, this is the series, uh, the title uh, that begins. And uh, how, do you get, how do you get access to this? You know, this is, this is a problem. <coughs> PowerPoint and so on. Uh, not as easy as flipping the pages on a book and so on. I did try and facilitate it a little bit, uh, put a number of links into it. Uh, you can jump around uh, in the thing to a certain extent. Uh, but uh, <coughs> these are the 17 main divisions. And in the introductory section, you have the list in there. You have an index. You have contents. And here you've got uh, the titles of the various uh, sections. And uh, we just don't have time to go through all these this morning. Here's some more of them and so on. <coughs> 17 of them in, in this uh, series. And uh, you can see uh, the flood split up into three different things. Uh, it, it takes the whole discussion, uh, like <coughs> number 14 there, to uh, explain what the flood is, the significance of the flood, uh, flood legends, and so on, before you get into the, the scientific part of it, and so on. Then uh, there's an index, just an example here of the index. You, uh, <coughs> Just the main topic, I mean, you, you could give it this 15 pages uh, PowerPoint slides of, of index and so on. But, uh, for instance, Ant A here, Anthony flew next to the bottom there. Ark of Noah, was it large enough? Uh, questions that these folks have and questions that uh, uh, don't commonly come up when you're uh, doing the sophisticated scientific uh, material that uh, we enjoy and more or less uh, tend to do around here. Uh, <laughs> then each of the 70 percent also has a, uh, a content listing and that's all in the introduction and it's at the beginning of every one of the uh, discussions itself. Uh, th this is for instance discussion of one, uh, contents. <coughs> Tiles the deep question so on, which is true science of the Bible and uh, this is a question most people have. Hey, which one's true? Which one's true? And w we switch that question, which is a good question, to what I think is a much better one. That is, what truth do I find when I look at both? You don't want to eliminate either science or the Bible. So uh, th that's uh, uh, part of the uh, issue there and on a whole um, bunch of other topics and the thing, but that's, that's where it lies there. And then at the end of each of the sections, we have review questions. This is helps the student. Uh, you know, we're losing so many Adventist students after they leave their home. They leave the church and so on. Uh, try and get them to uh, get into these issues and so on. Thought, well, I'll make some questions here. And uh, when you make a question, of course, uh, it puts it in a slightly different mode because they're faced with a question. And when the questions are first listed, for instance, uh, <coughs> it's uh, given without the answer. Then if they look just a little further down, uh, they'll find the question in the answer. Uh, <coughs> for instance, for what importance can be learned from the history of catastrophism concept as it has been viewed by the scientific community. Well, the scientific community has changed from belief in catastrophism to no catastrophism and back to catastrophism uh, type of thing. And <coughs> when they look at uh, a little further down, they can get the answer. Question four down here, the answer is there, uh, which, you know, it tells you that scientific conclusions are not permanent, definite, and so on. So the, the, uh, the uh, intent is to enlighten these students in a simple way uh, not as simple as I wish sometimes, uh, about uh, these issues and what is going on in this great battle here between science and, and the Bible. Well, uh, uh, discussion one, a deep question. This would be the, the beginning of the, the, the first of the 17 uh, sections and so on. And we get to just what I mentioned here. 
Uh, a better question is, right in the middle there, what truth do I find when I examine both signs in the Bible? Uh, the broader picture is much better. Uh, discussion two, where did life come from? I, I hesitated to put this in here, but uh, it's, it's one of the big issues, and I, I'll just mention a little bit about it. You folks all know all about this, I think, or should, because we never cease to talk about it in this class. Uh, as Richard Coley, you know, a teeny little micro, 500 of them, end to end to make a, a millimeter and so on. And what are the contents? Uh, it tells you how complex one of these little microbes is. Now, mycoplasma is about half the linear measurements of S.R.E. Coley, it's smaller. Uh, but we know a lot more about this one. Uh, and it's got over 2 million protein molecules and over 4,000 different kinds. And, you know, of course, the issue is how are you ever going to get this all together to start life at the same time, same place on the Earth and have all these right molecules? It's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's almost a, a question you don't have to ask. How could this happen just by chance? Uh, and, of course, you know, a lot of the things in, in uh, uh, one single individual mo uh, organism, as you recall it, and so on. We have more listings down there. And so uh, then uh, we talk, of course, about a lot of biology te uh, textbooks uh, talk about this Miller-Urey experiment uh, done at the University of Chicago in the 1950s when uh, they had this apparatus here and so on, and uh, they were able to produce several amino acids by sparks in these gases listed at the right there, ammonia, hydrogen, methane, water vapor, and so on. And the, in the trap below, they were able to find these. And this is, this is about as far as uh, the evolutionary uh, model of chemical evolution uh, has gotten. And, and it's the triumph of it. And it doesn't go beyond the simple organic molecule level of amino acid or, or bases, a few bases, the amino acid from that thing. And uh, so it, it, uh, students see this. Millions of students look at this in their, in their textbooks. And we discuss it, of course. And then uh, after that, the rest of the story is here, and it is uh, uh, the problems of chemical evolution. And Dr. I, Ralph? I, I list 10 different problems here. Um, what accident created that apparatus? What accident created that apparatus that they proved that with? Yeah, sure. Well, yeah, that, that's included there, of course, you know. Uh, uh, what chemicals do in the laboratory does, is not necessarily what's going to happen on an empty earth without any chemists or uh, any laboratories and so on. Uh, where was the soups? Uh, selection of needed molecules. Uh, you know, you've got to pick uh, the right amino acids to make the right protein. <coughs> Selecting the right optical isomer, the right hand, left handed has to be picked because uh, left ones are picked in living things. Organic molecules do not survive, that's well known. Most of them uh, would disappear before they even got into the ocean of the Earth uh, in the atmosphere itself. Uh, formation of large molecules, how, how do you, you have to have a system for doing this. Origin of genetic code, uh, and you go on. I mean, biochemical pathways, uh, how did cells form? Uh, how did reproduction get started? Uh, origin of DNA and proof reading system. So uh, that this, anyway, that's, that's that particular icon and uh, certainly one very much in favor of creation now. Parasites and diseases. Uh, uh, Sean Pittman, who's sitting right over here, has been putting on the <laughs> internet the last few days. Uh, very good material on this. Uh, issue of parasites and disease. But this is one of the questions that people want, hey, you know, what about tapeworms and all this other stuff that we have, uh, type of thing. And that, that's uh, discussed uh, uh, 
at the end of this discussion and so on, I talk about parasites and how it being middle there, mainly degeneration. This is, uh, uh, keep that in mind, that that's, and that's what uh, Sean's been emphasizing also in his thing. And then uh, uh, suggestion, how are you going to answer some of these things, like these special structures in these, in these parasites? And uh, that was the first sentence there. Some who believe in creation suggest that parasites are the result of genetic engineering uh, in the past by man or Satan. Others suggest that parasites were a fascinating part of a very good original creation. And uh, I suggest, you know, keep in mind that each one of us was a parasite at a time in our lifetime. Uh, you know, before you were zero uh, days of age at all, you, you have nine months there where you're a parasite. And uh, so uh, let's not be too hard on parasites. Uh, eye problems. Uh, I could not, of course, do this without getting into the eye situation. I'm just going to uh, quickly uh, just show you various examples. We've, we've, we've talked about this sometimes here. Uh, but it, uh, you have different kinds of eyes. and These are just light detecting eyes. They don't make a picture. Uh, we have some picture uh, making eyes like the compound eye of the insect. Uh, that gets very much more sophisticated. This is our eye, uh, the normal. Uh, some call it the camera eye, uh, the simple eye, because it just has one lens compared to the compound eye. Uh, then you've got uh, chamber nautilus that has a uh, just a pinhole eye, just a hole, no lens, nothing. Uh, eyes filled up with seawater. Uh, it's a very simple kind of eye compared to others very closely related uh, eyes and so on. And then uh, Copalia, the uh, copepod, one millimeter wide, that's, that's got a scanning. Those, those two blue spots, the elongated blue spots you see in the middle uh, of the thing, uh, at the top and bottom and so on. Those are uh, green arrow there. Uh, those vibrate back and forth. And like a television camera principle, they, they, they scan the picture and uh, uh, very interesting little thing. Uh, how did that all evolve? Uh, no, no survival value, you know, unless you have the various parts working. And you have to, and those parts, what's going to suggest any gradual process? It, this, you know, it kind of hits pretty hard the uh, idea of gradual evolution. Uh, just a, uh, <coughs> we raised three questions there in connection with the different kinds of eyes. One is, we find advanced eyes in simple organisms, simple eyes in advanced organisms. Um, B, evolutionary isolated animals have similar eyes. That's a very interesting thing. We'll talk about it in a couple more slides after this. Organisms that are evolutionary closely really sometimes have very different eyes. Now I mentioned the uh, pinhole eye of the chamber nautilus and the uh, normal eye of the squid, for instance, they're in the same class, uh, very k different kind of eye. Uh, it doesn't seem like these two organisms uh, really originate from a common ancestor when they have such a different kind of eyes. Uh, and th the thing is really serious on the question of this uh, normal eye, like our eye. Uh, here is an evolutionary tree. The left-hand side uh, it's what we call the protostomes, and they have uh, ornaments like the snail. You can see a snail there at the left. Those are the, uh, uh, the squid, cuttlefish, octopus, all belong in that group, the mollusks. And they have an entirely different evolutionary origin than the group on the right, which is that main branch on the right, excluding the first two. All those others have uh, eyes quite similar to ours, uh, snake, whether it be a snake or a chimpanzee and so on, it's very similar to ours. Now, the thing is that when we look at the eyes, considering all the variety I showed you, you look at the eyes of uh, those at the right versus uh, the eyes of a mollusk or a squid, 
they were very similar. How did evolution, by random changes, produce the same thing? Th this has been an issue that's been around uh, for over a century. So, uh, when people discovered uh, this similarity. This tells you a little bit about how, how similar uh, those two eyes are. This is a, uh, the eye of a squid on the left and the eye of your eye, if you want to, on the man and the ver vertebrate on the right. And look, all these parts, similar. Uh, yet, you know, they're supposed to have been, uh, evolved entirely different areas. Uh, it doesn't seem, you know, it, that uh, evolutionary pattern would be so s focused on producing all these complex parts the same way by random change. Well, uh, moving on here, uh, great time question, of course. That, that's the, the big issue, at least between uh, uh, the biblical model and a lot of Adventists who suggest, well, uh, uh, life has been around here for billions of years. And so we, we uh, discussed that at length in, in this uh, series here. Right? It uh, starts our discussion <coughs> on number seven here in the, the proposition. And uh, I follow traditional Adventism here in this and that. Uh, <coughs> take choice number C. But I, I give them three choices here. First one, God created everything during the six day creation. Second one, God created the solar system during the six day creation. Or third one, uh, God prepared the earth and created life on earth in six days. Uh, and uh, we lean towards that one. Ellen G. White is definitely uh, in model two or three. Uh, uh, that, that, that their universe is older, there's been life before creation week here and so on, and the universe, uh, that's quite well authenticated by her, and so on. And this is a, generally the, the pattern we tend to follow in connection with this. So it, it gives preference to this thing. Then go on to uh, uh, discussion number eight, the great time questions. Uh, questions about a recent creation. I mentioned three of them. Uh, uh, Dr. Roth? And yes? Um, um, John 17, uh, and two prayer to Christ, he mentions about the glory he had with the Father before the creation of the earth. In John 17, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Christ mentions uh, mm -hmm. two different prayers about the glory you had with the Father before the creation of the earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, now, we, uh, I also mentioned uh, Job 38.9, where God created a dark, a dark swaddling band around the earth, uh, versus uh, Genesis 1, where it talks about the earth being without form, void, and darkness, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, those uh, texts support the idea that there was an earth here before creation week. Then it, when you get to, uh, I think Genesis 1, 14, talks about the sun being created on the fourth day. Uh, that one leans in the other direction. Incidentally. It's not a clear picture we have there, but uh, uh, traditionally we have felt that the universe is older than the earth. Uh, or at least life on Earth. It, uh, well, uh, I just, problems. What problems are they going to face? These students, uh, they're going to go out, they're going to go to school, and advanced school, uh, and they're going to see, f learn about fossils and other things. You want to prepare them for this. And so you, you coral reefs, uh, living reefs, you can grow these living reefs if conditions are ideal uh, within a few thousand years. Uh, it's not a good argument against the Bible at all. Nevertheless, it's used quite often. Uh, fossil reefs, uh, serious questions on identification of these. And so, some of the scientific literature, th they're calling fossil reefs that are only about 10 centimeters high and 20 centimeters wide. They call that a reef. Uh, 
you have to check your literature on that stuff. Uh, uh, second issue, the glaciation. Uh, and these ice, uh, it happens to be Athabasca Glacier here, but in these ice layers, we find these layers, and are they annual, and so on. Uh, and uh, I point out the weaknesses in that, including the fact that, you know, they <coughs> by narrowing, the, you don't see these as you go down, way down towards the lower layers. You don't see them. Uh, you try and detect them by the amount of dirt in there, and they have isotope studies also, and so on. Uh, but uh, by narrowing the beam of the laser to detect these and so on, they were able to add 25,000 years to the Greenland. It tells you how subjective this is, you know. And if they, if they narrow the beam some more, they're going to be able to add some more years too, you know. It's, when you're measuring dust, it's not a very clear, uh, clear fa factor at all. And then uh, radiometric dating. Uh, I go into quite a few details about this, but the, the point I make to them is some of those dates do agree. And this is the Grand Canyon. You see those arrows at the right. You've got 550 million years at that lowest level, 350 higher up, 260. But then you go on up to the uh, Junkeret Plateau, lava's up there. That top arrow up at the left points in that direction. And you get uh, a lead lead date of uh, 2 million 600 and so on. So I point out to them, some of these dates agree, some of them don't. I tend to lean towards the idea. Uh, there may be factors that were active during the flood, and uh, especially uh, hydrostatic pressure or degassing of the mantle uh, during the flood that will produce the uh, potassium argon dates, the gradual potassium argon dates that give you a sequence type of thing, uh, and that we need to do further study in this area. Uh, we get to uh, our favorite carbon 14 uh, thing. In, Another discussion in, in this one here. Great time questions, data favoring the recent creation, and uh, I can't take much time to discuss this, uh, but uh, here are the topics we discussed there. Under two, this is the outline for the discussion. Uh, rates of erosion too fast. Uh, oceans should be full of sediments. Old flat surfaces should be gone. Uh, flat gaps in the rock layers, paraconformities. Uh, ancient carbon-14. Uh, why is it there, you know, in these, these very ancient uh, uh, samples? It's supposed to be hundreds of millions of years old. Uh, soft tissue in ancient dinosaurs should not be there. Humanity's growth rate is too fast. We're, we're growing at a tremendous rate. Uh, how come we didn't fill the Earth a long time ago if we're uh, half a million years or a million years of humanity on the earth. Uh, the impressive evidence for human activity is recent. Well, that's, uh, you know, uh, pyramids are recent, uh, aqueducts are recent. Uh, the good, solid evidence for man is, is recent. Writing, uh, history, recent, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, and mutations too frequent for you to survive long ages. Uh, and uh, Sanford's uh, discussions here and so on there, uh, point that little point out and so on and so on. So, uh, and, and I uh, uh, make the point, you know, sure, okay. So they talk about these billions of years and they got, you know, uh, five billion years, uh, well, 4.5, 4.5 billion years for life on Earth. They've got it. Uh, that's gonna do nothing for them for the improbabilities they face in connection with originating the first life, for instance. It's just not going to do it. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dr. Roth? Yes? I like what you're saying because it seems to me like time is making the problem a lot worse for them. Well, it is, yeah. No. Well, it's not making it worse, no. It does help them. Keep going. Well, I like a little exaggeration. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the more time you have, the more chance you have of improbable events occurring. But, you know, when it's so remote, uh, Paul, I think uh, Sean has a, a comment. When it's so remote, uh, even when you give them that time, uh, 
it doesn't do any good to, 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 to limit life to three and, uh, uh, three and a half billion years. It just, I mean, it, it, virtually nothing, it's gone. Yeah, on the one hand, it makes it worse, or better, because it allows more time to make unlikely random mutations and more time for that. So, but the odds against that, like you said, are extraordinary, so it doesn't really help significantly. On the other hand, it really does make it worse. Because Sanford, who spoke here a few yeah. weeks ago, he pointed yeah. out that <laughs> extra time also allows for extra bad mutations, yeah. right? Yeah. And so if you have slowly reproducing creatures, more time makes it worse. It works. Yeah. Because you just go it downhill. <laughs> good point. Very good point. <clears throat> anyway, getting to fossils uh, uh, sooner or later, and uh, this is not as strong a uh, an icon as. Uh, my think is I think most people are not aware of the fossil record, and a lot of people, uh, it's a difficult one. It's not, uh, well, it's a lot of things are very much in favor of creation. The sequence of the fossils, I think, is one that is mentioned in Adventist uh, sophisticated circles quite often is, hey, uh, uh, what are you going to do about the sequence of the fossils? Well, you talk about fossils, you've got to, you know, you've got to mention Tyrannosaurus Rex, so I did. Just want to let you know I didn't overlook it, uh, but this is just a model, and you can <coughs> Dr. Kermatis there uh, for scale. Uh, but here, here, here's the here's the the issue. Uh, you see these uh, the sequence, and that is man is up clear up there at the top towards the right. He's clear up there. Uh, in the middle section, you have a dominance of reptiles. Uh, that is the Mesozoic, really not the middle, but anyway, uh, and that second one down. In the Paleozoic, you have a lot of organisms that we don't have now, and the evolutionists feel, hey, this is really strong evidence for evolution, especially since your simplest life is done at the bottom, at Precambrian. Well, th this is uh, uh, an issue, they feel. There's gradual progression here, and uh, if you don't believe in this, you're really not a scientist type of thing. Well, uh, we have some answers for this. Uh, the one I favor is uh, Professor Clark's ecological zonation theory. And that is the idea that uh, 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 the uh, sequence represents what happened to the flood. A lot of creationists go another route, and I don't support this one that much because I don't think it's valid. And that is that the geologic column is not valid. And this has been a great point of contention, uh, actually, between uh, groups uh, like uh, Answers in Genesis, the uh, uh, Creation Ministries International, uh, the Creation Research Society. They all tend to lean towards this idea, hey, the column is not valid, and that uh, uh, because of that, we, uh, we don't accept this issue. Well, I can tell you, you know, you, uh, you look at the Grand Canyon, you can find, can't find a single flowering plant in the, all those layers of the Grand Canyon. You can't find a single mammal, a fossil. And, uh, this is, this is an issue uh, that we have to provide some answers to these folks, and I think that there is some fairly good support, as you'll see as we get through this. But uh, traditionally, uh, creationists who do not believe in the fossil sequence have uh, pointed out that in places the, the sequence is out of order. Now, you've got here these two mighty clips, and then the uh, Switzerland, and they have other examples, but uh, a lecture was just given here about 50 miles from here uh, two months ago, point out, hey, the, the mine eclipse don't demonstrate at all uh, that the GLI column is correct. The issue is You look where that tertiary layers are pointed down there, the, the uh, 
label up at the right. And you see it point that's Eocene flesh there, Eocene layers. You got up there you got Mesozoic layers. Mesozoic is below the tertiary. Uh, and so uh, the, the, point is, the point is, hey, you can't trust this. You like, Come, these things are out of order. Now, the, the, the bad thing I, or by using the Mayan cliffs is that it's so obvious these things have slid. You look at the left one, and you see various layers there, through there, and the same layers are in the one at the right, but the one at the right had slid up on top of the one at the left. You have the same sequence at the left as you have at the right. Uh, and it's obvious that uh, the right one is riding on top of this one, and you're using an obvious case of sliding to say there's no validity to the GLI column. This is not good. It's, uh, anyway, uh, going on. Uh, so the big issue is <coughs> your GDI column to the left, evolution, Cambrian explosion, first life form, so on, billions of years in that middle column, uh, gradual evolution, the creation model, probably some before creation year, uh, we're not actually sure about that. Uh, for a long time. Then you have a few pre-flood centuries, most of the column from the flood, and then uh, afterwards, at the end, uh, post-flood. So that, that's, that's the, uh, the general uh, issue. Which of these two is true? Uh, creation model, uh, if it isn't, you're in deep trouble because uh, you don't have a six-day creation. If all these organisms developed over billions of years, forget about a six-day creation. And if you don't have a six-day creation, was God telling us the truth when he said he did it created in six days? Was Christ uh, misleading us when he talked about creation as though it was a, a real event? Uh, and he talked about the flood as though it was a real event. Uh, if God's wrong, Christ is wrong, and so on, where are, we're back to, you know, hey, how did life originate? Uh, you're, you're, you're stuck. Uh, you don't have a good answer. You, and I tend to come back to this, of course, because I think the weight of evidence is in favor of the Bible model. We don't have all the answers. Uh, and we, of course, want these students to know a little bit about uh, uh, the issues involved here, and so. Uh, but uh, here's your distribution of organisms throughout the, the geologic column. Note that uh, <coughs> we have these simple organisms down below, S kind of simple, more complex organisms in the middle, and the most advanced up at the top. Although uh, you have to admit that even the simple, simplest algae down here, clear in the bottom. Uh, is a very complex organism, extremely complex organism. How did it, how did it come about, type of thing. So, uh, the ecological zonation model suggests that the sequence we have in the fossil record reflects the sequence distribution of organisms <coughs> before the flood. And uh, this is what would happen by these different <coughs> colored arrows. <coughs> First, during the flood, found the great deep breakup, so you have a lot of marine material there. Purple arrow, uh, red arrow, uh, and so on. Maybe some lowlands, uh, higher up here. The pre-flood seas were all down in the low region, and this represents land, uh, landscapes higher up. Uh, orange arrow, higher up, and yellow arrow, and so on. And when they're gradually destroyed by the rising floods, they end up in the same order, albeit compressed, uh, in the depositional basins during the flood. 
Uh, and this is the uh, suggestion of how animals were distributed before the flood. If all these animals, like dinosaurs and so on, um, were there before, they had to have a place to live. And they lived in the middle regions. Uh, marine organisms lived in the lower regions like they do now. But we didn't have these middle region organisms. We don't have them now. They're not competing with present organisms, so we don't have the same distribution. Uh, in general, we do, but in specific details, we don't, like I've mentioned to you. Uh, <coughs> and, uh, but if the distribution organisms before the flood was like illustrated here, there, your blue arrow down there, the lowest one on the right, would be your microorganisms. The purple arrow would be your marine organisms. Keep this in order. Your red arrow would represent your lowlands, like your carboniferous coals uh, that we find in the fossil record. Higher up, we have the dinosaurs, uh, the uh, <coughs> kind of buff colored arrow, uh, and the, the yellow arrow uh, higher up. There you have the mammals and so on. This is the way the organisms lived before the flood. If you bury this gradually, and so on, you're going to have that order in the sequence. And uh, uh, of course, uh, geologists, you know, they, they think this is a heresy, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, but uh, this is what you have. Below the red line, microscopic organisms, these have been in the ground. They live there now. They've been there before. Between the red and the blue line, you have all marine organisms. That's a very strange thing for, uh, for evolution in a way. But that would be the pre-flood seas, the lowest pre-flood seas. You'd have some other pre-flood seas higher up for some other organisms, uh, as we illustrated in the previous picture and so on. And then you'd have the most advanced organism at the top. So you have somewhat of a sequence here. You'd expect this from the flood model and this interpretation, uh, as well as you would from the evolutionary model. So this idea of the, this growth, uh, this is reflected to a certain extent in what we have on the Earth right at present. Uh, but certainly would be reflected more if you had all these uh, uh, other organisms that had to be accounted for. The dinosaurs had to have a place to live. Uh, Demetri Don had to have a place to live and so on. Every time I mention this, there's always a, at least one person who will respond with that there's certain creatures that live together now, like crabs and lobsters, who are separated in the geologic column by some distance. Mm -hmm. Is there any reasonable, I mean, I've looked for some time for this, and I, I think more and more recent data shows that there's a little bit more overlap than most people realize, but uh, do you have any response to that question? Uh, the, there's no question the flood would have changed the ecology quite a bit. Uh, and the, the crab and lobster, uh, that is a, a minor glitch, I would say. Look at the whole picture. Look at the whole picture. You can always find something besides, uh, uh, well, if you do very much uh, study in the fossil record, you, you don't take those patterns too seriously because you know that next week somebody's going to find one a little lower and then they'll say, uh, 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 we don't have the total picture, we don't have the total picture. So it's, it's, uh, it's a point, but it's so minor that I, compared to the whole thing. The issue really is uh, more the general picture, which you know I, I think to a certain extent fits quite nicely what you'd expect if you provide for these ordinances that aren't living right at present. Well, uh, a uh, question. Yeah. Can we go back to the scheme? Yes, how far down have the turtles been seen? Has the what? Turtles. Turtles, uh, they go down to, uh, well into the Mesozoic. They go all the way. Uh, uh, no, no. I'm just kidding. They don't go all the way down, <laughs> but uh, Sean is a specialist on this. He can. Okay. 
Well, <laughs> moving on here. Uh, <coughs> then we get, it. I mentioned, of course, the gaps in the fossil record. Uh, Darwin mentioned this, read the, just the last thing. This is Charles Darwin talking. He says, geology surely does not find a such finely graduate organic chain. You don't find this fossil, uh, sequence through the thing. These fall into definite major groups. Lots of, lots of suggestions of small groups. Okay, that, uh, the issue is with the major groups. Between the major groups, you'd expect the most, uh, the greatest number of intermediates, and that's where they aren't there. Geology surely does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain, and this, perhaps, is the most obvious and greatest objection adherence to my theory. And then he goes on to talk about paraconformities and other things like that. Hey, the record's not perfect, and so on, so that uh, that's why we don't have these intermediates, but that has not held up. Uh, very well over time. But so on that point, it seems like that would be a much more right here contested yeah. point or something that the evolutionists should respond to. To me, that's a huge issue that, that we don't see these intermediate one here or one there. <coughs> of the, the landscape fossil record should be littered with all these weird and unusual. Uh, we should have forms. a solid continuity of these organs trying to evolve. Yeah. Uh, many failures, maybe a rare uh, success once in a while. Uh, no, it, it's not there. And it, it's, a, it's a fairly solid argument. And where you'd expect the greatest number of intermediates between the major groups, they aren't there at all. You find none. Uh, and I, I give them references on that stuff. And so Does this get discussed at all to, by the evolutionists? Do they have any response to that? Uh, National Science Foundation uh, uh, statement says, uh, oh, it's, it's been solved. We're finding more and more. Uh, the case solved. Uh, it is not solved at all. Well, the standard response I get is that uh, it's back to catastrophism, like you say, and the fossil record is representative of, <coughs> of brief, brief snapshots of time where a catastrophe hit in a brief instant of geologic time <coughs> and only preserved a small section right then and it didn't have time to preserve the evolutionary progression. Mm -hmm. And so you just get small snapshots in different parts of time. And that's the usual response I get. Yeah, and you end up with the conclusion that uh, catastrophes occur only when evolution is not going on. Um, um, so yeah. you mean once upon a time when uniformitarian principle <laughs> was the way things were going? Um, uniformitarian view was used to explain evolution, but now <coughs> that it's clear that catastrophes <coughs> have been happening, now it's catastrophes that once again supposedly support evolution. How is it that evolution can never be challenged? Well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's the dominant, it's the dominant the evolution paradigm. evolution itself evolves. <laughs> it's the dominant paradigm. Let me just mention a couple other points. Your, uh, our time is almost up. And, uh, uh, quick question up there. Uh, well, what about punctuated equilibrium as an explanation where uh, you have uh, stable populations over time? Then punctuated equilibrium deals only at a species generic level. It does nothing about the big issue of the class order uh, level where that's where the major groups are. It's no answer whatsoever. Uh, bats, first bat you find the fossil record of the bat. Uh, the, uh, the Cambrian explosion is another one uh, that I mentioned in connection with the fossil record, and that is that all of a sudden you, you find all these different organisms, and you don't find the intermediates below it, and it's, it fits so nicely. And it's all marine material. It fits so nicely with the idea that, hey, this represents the pre-flood seas. It, uh, and uh, that, that's what you do. In the Grand Canyon, that red arrow, that's where you have your Cambrian explosion. Uh, there you have all kinds of, all kinds of, and quite a number of marine organisms appear there suddenly. Below them, no, just microscopic material, uh, which could be infiltration and whatnot. Uh, this pointed out to you. That red line there is where that red arrow was. Yeah, in the Grand Canyon, the previous slide, and so on. Then, uh, as far as you want to know how uh, linearly how this works, uh, it's very uh, 
serious. Uh, because this is a time scale for the Earth, that gray line in the middle. Uh, very first life, supposed to be at 3,500 million years. You stay in that, no evolution to speak of, for about 3 million years. And then 540 million years and so on, all of a sudden you have that Cambrian explosion, that red line. And that's where most of your fossil phyla of animal appear in that very short period. And some say 5 million, some say 50 million, and so on. Uh, doesn't matter. Uh, very strange. The fossil record does not talk about gradual evolution. It's a very episodic uh, and erratic record that you deal with there. <clears throat> and then all of a sudden, that red line, during just a little period of that red line here, you get most of your animal phyla. It, uh, all, all the animal phyla except one. Well, yeah, it depends on which book you're reading. <laughs> well, uh, uh, the but most of them, yeah. Uh, <coughs> uh, then the astonishing Genesis flood, uh, I won't spend too much. Was the ark large enough? We, we have to close uh, pretty quick, so just let me make a couple comments here, rapidly here. <coughs> The idea, yeah, the ark was large enough. Uh, I, I give him the details, a couple of references on this. Uh, the uh, right here, for instance, uh, top line says uh, the ark is so big, you know, it has room for 550, 522 railroad stock cars. Each can hold 240 sheep. Uh, this means you could have 125,000 sheep on the ark if you stuffed it full of sheep. You know, it's not a very good, very good model in a way. So uh, but uh, Ward Merapi uh, thinks, no, three floors, floor space, don't stack any cages and so on. You're still going to be able to put 16,000 animals on there. And we don't have to put in the marine organisms. We don't have to put in the uh, <coughs> uh, plants and so on, although some evolutionists say you do, uh, and so on. Uh, and so you'd have room uh, for this. Uh, then there's a question of the flood, uh, extremely widespread layers. We don't appreciate how widespread these layers are. You go out there and look at them. <coughs> Dakota formation, this thing's only about 100 feet thick, averages. Look how widespread it is. You're n there's no way you're going to spread layers that on our present surface of the Earth right now. You have all these mountains going up and down all over the place. There's no way. It's an entirely different world out there during that flood than you have at present or that you'd have during uh, uh, normal time. <coughs> yeah. <It was. laughs> Brian Bull and Fritz Guy were right. I Thank mean, you. It was a flat Earth. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't, go, don't go too far on that one. <laughs> Morrison Formation, you know, from uh, Texas to Canada. Uh, and uh, that layer up there, the, you see the red arrow. There's a yellowish layer above it. That's the Dakota. Uh, go 350 miles south, the yellow layer above the red arrow, that's the Dakota again. That tremendously widespread, uh, something very different you had there during the flood. And, well, uh, <coughs> lastly, I, I talk about a science being in trouble. And uh, <coughs> this is the outline of that discussion. <coughs> and I'll just mention secularism in science number six there, for instance. Uh, half a million scientists interpreting nature without God. <coughs> Excuse me. A tremendous bias against God in the scientific literature. The students need to know. They're not looking at the study of nature that they see in their biology book from a level playing field at all. It's a field that excludes any possibility of God. And uh, they need to know about that bias uh, that's there. Uh, you open that door and the whole picture changes in terms of interpretations. Uh, 
you're not trapped into naturalism, a closed box that science has built for itself. <coughs> and so last uh, paragraph here, <coughs> turns out that as presently practiced, science is the odd combination of the study of nature and a secular fallacy that rules God out. You can exclude God by definition, but that does not work there are well in case God exists. You, you should not uh, follow that route. Well, uh, <clears throat> last sentence here again. Uh, same quotation I gave you last week. It's so important I decided to put it back here again. Those who wish to doubt will have opportunity. But while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. So keep that in mind uh, as you look at this issue. Uh, people are not going to be forced into, the, into this thing, but there's plenty of evidence on which uh, to base your faith. And uh, <clears throat> you can get all this stuff on my uh, web page. Now that's up, uh, been up for three weeks, at least the material's been there for three weeks. Uh, you can get the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> videos I showed you last Sabbath, and you get these 17 uh, discussions there. They're uh, readily downloadable. Uh, no copyright problems on them and so on. Just uh, go ahead and uh, uh, teachers can use them. Uh, I'm, there's going to be a teachers conference next August uh, and for North American teachers and I believe Ch uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, what, Na Nashville, Nashville, Tennessee, and so on. Uh, I hope to get some uh, information to those teachers about this availability. Uh, a lot of the teachers don't know what the questions are. They don't know what the answers are. And I'm not sure I have all the answers, but I try and help them. So anyway, that's, that's what we are doing here. Yeah. So. I just want to take this time to, to thank you. I, th I consider you the father of uh, Avenist uh, creationism. And um, I thank you for putting your time and effort into presenting this free material for the church. Yeah. And uh, I think you've done a wonderful job with wow. your, your career and your life. And um, I'll publish it as much as I can. Thank you very much for the, the website. Well, thank you for your encouragement. Uh, <coughs> coming from an authority like you, I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> we all appreciate your... And, uh, you get into that scientific literature more than anybody else I know of. And boy, that's it's so appreciated. It's <coughs> wonderful to be in the presence of two warriors like this. <coughs> um, but could we go to, to this last slide? Uh, there's something that really this one? My, Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. It says, those who wish to doubt will have opportunity, while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence on which to rest their faith. This is a fascinating phenomenon. So the question that, that comes to my mind, really, at this point is, why didn't God arrange things so that doubt would be impossible? So what would be imparted? So doubt. Doubt. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and and, and, and yeah. as I'm thinking about that, <laughs> you know, um, those of us who have been privileged to have students, we have also had the occasion when we were wondering, how do I get through to this person? <laughs> and, and then we remembered, aha, yes, the best revenge on students is when they get to have students. Mm -hmm. You've heard about the revenge on children, <laughs> it's grandchildren. Mm -hmm. uh, those of you who have had children, uh, what do you do uh, when you ask your child for, to make the bed, you know, and they come up with these wonderful arguments very cogent, very well-reasoned as to what's the point when I'm going to go into bed tonight anyway? 
Why don't I just, you know, why do I have to make the bed in the morning when I'm going to just get back <coughs> into it and make a mess of it anyhow? So what's the deal? And why do I need to clean my room when it'll be, become a mess again anyhow? You know, all this kind of thing. It, it's a fast, and, and when you're faced with these, you, you, at first, when you hear it the first time, you almost think like, what? Who thunk up this? And then you vaguely remember similar types of reasonings decades past when you were their <coughs> age. Strange the way that works. You know what I'm saying? So the question that comes up is, if is that type of, you know, people point to that and say, but if the truth was really clear, then doubt would be impossible. Well, our children demonstrate to us all the time that those things which we see as the most obvious can be challenged even by those who are most immature. So thus, the question about doubt is not whether it can be ruled out by some demonstration or ev proof, but how do we deal with doubt when it arises in our own minds? Well, those who really desire to know the truth. <laughs> it's a matter of motivation. If you desire, God's not going to leave you hanging. Um, two, two things, I, two comments I'll make. I, I don't know. I've wondered about your statement t t to a certain extent. Uh, God gives us freedom of choice, and he respects that choice, and he protects that choice. Number two, in this issue of the great controversy between good and evil, uh, if there were no doubt, would the test of the great controversy be as effective? would it ever come to an end? Uh, I think in part of in God's great demonstration of what is good and what is bad, you have to allow for evil to come to its fruition. And folks, I, I must say, as I watch the news and all the immorality going on and all that, total lack of interest in saying anything that's true anymore in politics. I wonder how long this can go on. Society is going to fall apart unless we get some integrity. It's However, in the, in the process of all this, we as a body of believers have been losing our young people by the millions through these years. And it's terrible, and when you see Plenty of evidence has been given, and when I hear you presenting this, and you wonder why our education system is failing so badly, that why aren't our teachers, our pastors so well versed in more than enough evidence given to believe in a creator God? Yeah. Well, you know, we uh, unfortunately. Not all our teachers know what they believe, uh, and worse than that, some of them don't believe in Adventism. And it, uh, we need to do all we can to help. That's the only thing I can say. I think if I can make an observation, um, uh, this website is part of the answer to that question. It's, uh, Yeah, well, it's uh, it's free, and I hope it's worth more than it costs. <laughs> well, I, I'm I'm glad the gentleman down here made it clear that kids are more logical than adults, but um, which is uh, which should be a little uh, mind opening right there. But anyway, um, <clears throat> I think we have more practice with making mistakes or something. Anyhow, the. Uh, the, the other question about the why, why did God include doubt in the uh, genetic code or whatever, um, you know, 
I, I've heard explanations like um, that seem to work for me anyway. That for one thing, we have to have free will, and um, therefore we we have to have all the range of possibility. And doubt is part of that um, that necessary range to to make sure that when we choose God, it is it is a, a pure choice and not a uh, if if you didn't have if if we didn't have doubt or weren't able to doubt God, then there we'd just be like automatons or something that were programmed to follow God, and that's not what He wanted. So that was my comment. On. I just had a, a thought of Jacob wrestling with the angel. He he felt like he was dealing with an enemy in some way, something, and yet he found out at, at the end who he was working with, and maybe that in some way our world is always working against faith mm -hmm. and hope and it seems to dominate just like the scientific mm -hmm. culture and mm -hmm. I think our young people need to realize they're accepted for who they are and we need more interaction between all of us a lot more mm -hmm. acceptance a lot more interaction because I think they're struggling they're wanting to believe and yet somehow they're giving up because they feel that their questions aren't valid or something, or that the world is more attractive. And they are the future of our church. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, you know, sometimes these discussions we have, I find them most fruitful to my own thinking. It occurs to me, <laughs> as I was sitting here, that uh, the <laughs> doubt is the frame of mind when, when you're unsure about something, yes? Well, as such, that means that it calls for a need to learn something. But most of the time, we don't think of doubt in those terms. We think of doubt as, oh, no, I've seen a weakness in something. All I've really demonstrated is my own personal confusion, which means I ought to be learning something. So doubt really cannot be excluded as long as there is an opportunity to learn something. Yeah. Does that sound yeah. like something oh. of interest? Oh, my, uh, you know, yeah. hence, if that's the case, then uh, we can't really expect God to remove all doubt because that would automatically also remove all possibility of learning anything. You have to remove all ignorance. <laughs> the thing is too though removing all doubt doesn't necessarily remove rebellion Satan really has no doubts mm -hmm. he knows that God exists he knows the truth of the whole story and he still hates God and so we have to finally come to the conclusion that sin is not based on a lack of information it's based on a form of insanity if you can't if you could have come up with a rational reason for sin to exist it wouldn't be sin mm -hmm. I mean Ellen White says that herself it's a, ultimately choices for, for things that aren't right, that we know aren't right, by definition, we choose them because of our desires. We love that which we know is wrong. And uh, that's the definition of sin. And it's insane. It's, there's no rational solution for that. And I'm not saying those who believe in evolution are, are sinful necessarily. There's some honest confusion out there, I sure. believe. And a lot of these people are good, sincere people, and I think a lot will be in heaven. But when you deliberately choose what you know is wrong, then, then you go into the realm of, of a form of insanity, and we've all done it. Well said. I, I want to thank you so much for what you're, what you're doing for our Adventist um, education. And um, just a couple comments on answers in Genesis. Um, um, you mentioned about the geologics column, and they do have articles uh, going along with what you're saying on that. Um, mm -hmm. And I also want to say they have been, the last 15 years at least, um, a huge help to my family, um, our four children. Mm -hmm. um, I've used their work in our Sabbath school divisions up in mm -hmm. Idaho. Um, they're fabulous. They're building an ark um, mm -hmm. soon. And um, for those with children, I would really recommend going on their site um, everything may not be what you agree with, but um, they have a huge amount of work 
um, publications and all that are, are great help and I, I feel like mm -hmm. our teachers should be using some of this stuff. Yes, we can ad adapt it to our particular beliefs, but I mean, they're a huge help, so thank you. I went through their museum, you know, in uh, Oklahoma there, uh, right near Cincinnati. It's a first class. Kentucky. <coughs> Kentucky, sorry. <coughs> it's a first class uh, museum. If you're ever near there, go go through it. It's really good. Uh, you know, uh, you can be proud of that. You can be proud of that, that museum. Very good. Yeah. I do, I'd just like to say uh, back here, I appreciate, uh, as I think everybody else here, the, the work that you've done and, and the resources mm -hmm. made available. It seems to me as though this is, uh, these resources, although now that they're on the internet, are available to whoever for whatever purposes that they wish, but it seems uh, especially targeted to the classroom, which is, which is essential, I think vital. Um, my frustration is that I feel as though it's sort of like we, we have a, an avalanche from this side and we have, you know, some little thing pushing back. I'm, I'm thinking in particular the, the popular media, you know, National Geographic Channel or things like this where just the, mm -hmm. the, the, the quality, you know, the sort of the media quality uh, of these materials, the, the design for the popular, you know, mm -hmm. sort of mind. Um, I, I, I view this as having a place, but we, we need to take the content and sort of popularize it so that it gets broader, broader dis distribution, especially um, for young people who, you know, who, do, who don't have much more than five minutes attention when they're on the internet. Uh, you know, could s this material be encapsulated in, in brief, you know, sort of modern trendy presentations that, that they could, uh, uh, could understand and grasp. Um, well, aren't you working on some of those things right now? Uh, well, the creation spotlight presentations yeah. will, will be brief and will be something like that, but uh, they're, mm -hmm. I, I feel like there's still a, yet a level of, of sort of popular, I don't know, media mm -hmm. design that, that could be done. Some really cool stuff. Uh, I, I wish that we could have that as well. Does Answer in Genesis have uh, such things, do you know? I just wish we could be, they do have a lot on their website. I just wish mm -hmm. we could be using it. I mean, they would come speak, you know, but they're not invited. And, um, Ken, Ken Ham, uh huh, I, yes. I I yeah, he's, I mean, you know, they have a little variance in us, and, um, but. I, I have a question. Do you have a site meter of any kind, and, and how much traffic have you gotten on the site since you opened it up? Uh, the site's been up for one year. Of course, nobody knew it existed. Uh, the last three weeks, yeah, it, um, it's just getting started, let's say. Now, you know, there, there are 14 videos. And they're on YouTube, and YouTube tells you the number of people. And uh, I looked there a day or two ago. I think there were 64 people had looked at the at the first video. Okay, uh, not as many had looked at uh, this uh, series here, of course, but this has not been advertised anywhere. And I don't know why people look at that video, because I don't know how anybody learns about anything. You know, uh, cyber oblivion is a very real thing. It, uh, unless you get people's attention, this does not, uh, uh, people are not going to look at this, uh, and so on. So it's a question of how you can get uh, people to know uh, what is available. Uh, but I uh, start to has more and more and has the general conference uh, discovered your site? Uh, they uh, th this was they not by next week. <laughs> you know, I, I knew a gentleman out of Florida. Did you know him, Doctor Doctor Dino? He would go from 
university to university and uh, 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 argue uh, on behalf of creation. Did a fantastic till he got thrown in jail. Um, I knew, so, you know, pay your on, on pay your taxes. Yeah, you pay knew your that. Taxes. That's exactly pay your taxes. But see, the thing is, once of us who who know and love this movement, one out of every five churches in this country don't have any young people. That's very sobering. So many Adventist schools are closing down. That is very sobering. Very, very sobering. We, we have to struggle. Why? Uh, Emilio Kennically used to say, sin happens to be fun for a season. You see, our young people, you know, uh, you talk about um, Nova, you talk about Discovery, you talk about National Geography. They're all anti-Christian, all, all anti-Christ, but they come across so attractive mm -hmm. to us, to young people. We'd rather watch them than even go to church. And it's, it's sad. What are we doing as believers who know that there is, uh, we have all the evidence to believe in a creator God. What are we doing? <clears throat> and something like what you have done for, for years and years you have spent on putting this together. How is it going to find its way to the Adventist <clears throat> homes? <clears throat> well, you can you only hope by word of mouth and so on that it will spread now. I guess uh, <coughs> word of email, uh, new term. There's a beautiful iPad app from the National Science Foundation, and every <coughs> clip that you look at is about two minutes and 30 seconds or less. And I think that in today's market for kids, if we could put up something that looks similar to what the National mm -hmm. Science Foundation has, we could attract them by the beautiful picture that's up there and they get there and they see the picture or they watch for a couple of minutes and then move on, which is the way they're, they like to see things today. I assume that it probably took the National Science Foundation a million dollars, which we don't have to do. Mm -hmm. But there ought to be some way that as, with all the expertise we have in the Adventist Church that we can find a way to make what we present beautiful. Now my second point is I've worked a lot with Adventist teachers. And there are many kinds of Adventist teachers. Some of them are very committed to knowing what Adventists teach and to teaching it. Some of them are teachers because they're teachers without the, the lack of the commitment. I think that our teachers need a, a great amount of encouragement and a lot of prayer because they have terrible responsibilities. And sometimes they fulfill their responsibilities well, sometimes they don't. Well, um, Doug, uh, those one, two minute things, uh, take note of this. You're working on this material. Yeah, it's an iPad app. Um, let me intervene just right here. Um, in developing these uh, Creation Spotlight PowerPoint presentations, one of the issue is the, uh, is the pictures, uh, and in particular copyright issues. Uh, there are stock photos that are really high quality pictures, but you can't necessarily distribute them you know, freely. Um, so what we're doing is we are getting access to Adventist photographers who uh, already have large numbers of photographs. Um, one fellow that we're working with who's, um, he, he's spoken here before, Matthew Preby has like 30,000 or, or more pictures that he's taken of all sorts of things. And we have access to those, free access to those. Uh, but I think we have, but the nature of things, we have to go the next step, and that is to, to actually almost create an association of Adventist photographers and put up shot lists where people say, I want this specific picture to illustrate this picture, you know, this particular point. Mm -hmm. And there's enough of an amateur community out there that I think some people will jump at the, at the chance to contribute, uh, especially if it's for meaningful, you know, reasons. Uh, and uh, the quality, uh, I think, can be very good. So we have some photographers who are just excellent. You just give them a task, and I think they can come back with some really high-quality stuff. At least for stills, I think that's good. That's the hardest thing, finding access to free media. Yeah. We, we may have to produce it ourselves. But you know, we've got to think of a large mm -hmm. enough network. We probably need a, somebody needs to develop a website for Adventist amateur photographers and, and uh, mm -hmm. have it 
not just where they can put up their pictures that can be searched, you know, they tag it and search it, uh, but with a shot list where we're specifically requesting these sorts of pictures. And I would say not just for our purposes, but for evangelism or all these other things, there's a real need for this networking based around pictures and maybe videos. Mm. Warren's been waiting And a, a picture is worth a thousand words or more. As a librarian, I can say that. <laughs> it speaks volumes. So I have a, I have a, a few comments on doubt, first with an illustration and then a couple observations. My illustration goes back to around 1979 when I was teaching at Newbold College in the religion department and also teaching a class in science and religion way back then. Um, we heard that there was going to be a debate. One of the Institute of Creation researchers, uh, Dwayne Gish, who has been a famous name among young earth creationists, was going to debate probably the world's greatest authority on vertebrate paleontology then, Gene Halstead, Dr. Gene Halstead. And I assume Halstead is probably deceased now. He was um, probably in his 60s when I heard him. Uh, the debate was shocking when I heard from the mouth of Halstead the praise he had for doubt. And he said that the scientific method is really based on doubt. Now, there's a partial truth there, because if doubt means asking questions to pursue truth, then scientific question is after truth, used rightly so. Um, but then he gave two examples from the Bible. He said one of the very earliest stories in Scripture is a story about doubt. It was the serpent that was asking the questions, scientific questions. And he actually praised the serpent. I just couldn't believe it. Just, I was shocked. The first person I've ever heard <laughs> praise a uh, certain in a biblical narrative. But then he went on, even in the New Testament, he said the greatest of the disciples was Thomas because he was a true scientist and he learned yeah. early on how to doubt. It was shocking, it was sad, it was upsetting. I went away just shaking my head. I think I've heard oh. the worst of the worst, you know. But then I thought of this, and it has application today. As a teacher in the classroom, I always encourage really tough questions. And I can picture a young man sitting in the back of the classroom at Columbia Union College. I knew he had didn't have much use for Adventism. I was teaching religion. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to encourage him to, to bring out his questions, his doubts. And I think in a safe environment, if we can cultivate our young people to think. And then secondly, we have to go beyond that. Secondly, help them develop a methodology so that the answers they find can be their own answers. We're not there just to provide an encyclopedia of knowledge and they flip to a certain page and ah, here's the answer and I'll go on my way. But if we can provide them a lifelong learning <coughs> experience of knowing how to wrestle with the tough questions, keeping one foot for sure firmly grounded in the Word of God, and then doing what you've done, Dr. Roth, and that is to show that the scientific method, when used appropriately and rightly, can produce great results. And I think mm -hmm. maybe your greatest contribution will be that, is maybe not providing answers, but providing a methodology that will help our young people. So that's my little speech today. I, I would just say uh, on the doubt issue, um, it, you can appear erudite by doubting, you know, and sure. and we do that in the intellectual game, yeah. you know, and, and, and so on. Sparring. Yes, but uh, this agnosticism is not the goal. We want truth, and if you just keep doubting everything, you're not going to find your truth as readily as if you look for, hey, what's the reasonable conclusion here? Weight of evidence. I like that better. Yeah. I love some of these comments I'm hearing. Uh, 
<clears throat> just have to remember, I'm an artist, and, and uh, a picture, they often say, is worth a thousand words, but it can also be worth a thousand lives as well, particularly with uh, devices like Photoshop and so forth. You can't believe everything you see. Very good. It seems like with doubt, there's, I, I guess maybe we could say there's a good kind of doubt, a bad kind of doubt, in essence. Uh, you know, the, the, mm. the bad doubt being more like, mm. sort of like, as the gentleman here was explaining, it's, it's mm. kind of like a one-sided, closed-minded kind of a doubt. <laughs> it's yeah. just like, Depends. I don't know, you might call it an immature yeah. doubt because it's really, it's something's Depends. wrong. It just depends on your motive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The motive is off. Okay, well, I think... I'd like to just add one more thought. And the bottom line in this question of doubt is what is truth? And that was the question asked at the trial of Jesus. And if we can also provide our young people ways of evaluating what is good and what is true from what is chaff and what must be uh, rejected. I think we, we will have accomplished great things. Well, I will go on to say that I think that it also helps to have them have a base of knowledge to start from. I, I think that one of the things we haven't done as much as we could mm -hmm. have, I think we're starting to do it. I think this, this website is a wonderful mm -hmm. uh, way of doing this, is to actually get some information so they don't feel like they are totally adrift. <coughs> I, um, I can remember a um, vice president of the General Conference retired in a meeting saying, the problem with geoscience is they start with their conclusions. Uh, they believe the Bible and then they try and bring the science to the Bible. And I, uh, I got up and I told them, uh, we uh, give us some of us who've been looking at the science the privilege of drawing some conclusions. Uh, I've looked at the data. I think it is more favorable towards the biblical view than it is toward the other. And uh, because I, if I uh, just reject everything. I said, I can't draw a conclusion and I cannot devote my life to that which is best. I'm just going to spend my time raising more questions. I want the privilege of drawing some conclusions. It's not a blind faith decision, at least for me, to, to pick the Bible. It's not blind faith. This is, there's plenty of evidence on which to base our faith. It says so right there. Don't forget, next week, um, Fritz Guy and Brian Bull will be here, and okay. we should have, a, hopefully, a, a, uh, an enlightening discussion. <laughs>